started then. And I'll, I'll go ahead and kick things off then. I think we've got, um, we'll have a few folks joining us in the waiting room, but um, most of the folks that have registered appear to be on. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Ron Acklepool. I'm the Director of Transportation and Environment for the Mid-America Regional Council. And uh, we're, we're really excited uh, this year to be doing another cycle of uh, federal fund programming for transportation projects in the metro area. Uh, it's an interesting time because we're working with a new uh, piece of legislation with the uh, Infrastructure uh, and Jobs Act or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which has a few changes to the, some of the programs that we typically work with. Um, we, we actually have not initiated the call for projects yet, but we did want to uh, take an opportunity to to kind of do a preview of it for folks that are likely to be submitting uh, applications through our process and uh, share some of what we know about the changes uh, from the new bill and some of the other policy issues that um, that we'll be looking at with the programming cycle this round with things like the adoption of our climate plan uh, last year that that's new to the new to the programming process and and so a few other um, a few other new things that we've been working on. So Mark, if you want to move to the next slide, um, put the agenda up on the screen. So yeah, today we're going to kind of cover some of the details of what we do know about the uh, Infrastructure and Jobs Act changes. Um, it's a new enough bill that a lot of the uh, guidance and regulation has not been developed for it. Uh, uh, the Department of Transportation folks are waiting on a appropriations bill to actually have the resources to begin doing that work. But we can make some assumptions based on what's, the, what's in the legislation. And, and because we program so far in the future, we wanted to share that with you before we started taking applications for these funds. Um, I, I'll, I'll note that we are recording this session. I, a few folks had asked if we would be able to post it for colleagues that weren't able to attend. And that would be something that we will do after the after the session and we'll also be providing some contact information for the staff here for folks that have additional questions before the uh, before the uh, call for projects actually opens or once it's underway. Um, today, uh, Mark Hansen, who's our principal planner in charge of our programming work, will be going over a lot of the material in the pro in the program. And Martin uh, Riverola, who's an assistant uh, director in the department and oversees our long range planning work, will also be sharing some of the policy issues with you. And so with that, I'll uh, once again, thank you for your time today and turn it over to Mark to walk us through the, the meat of the program. Great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, like Ron said, my name is Mark Hansen. I'm principal planner here at mid -America Regional Council. And if you've been through uh, our programming process before, you have likely, uh, we have likely crossed paths. So uh, thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today and, and starting preparation on uh, getting ready for our next call for projects. So we will uh, kind of jump right in here to what we know a little bit about uh, the new infrastructure bill the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, is the kind of formal uh, long name. A lot of people just refer to it though as the bipartisan bill. And, and you'll, likely, uh, you'll likely hear me refer to it uh, both ways uh, through, throughout the course of this uh, presentation. So if you hear me uh, talking about the bipartisan bill, we are talking about the same thing as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. A little bit of overview on this. Uh, like Ron said, we. We're hoping to have uh, quite a few more details about, uh, about the, the bill uh, here, but the details are kind of slow in, in coming, as you might expect. It is relatively new. Uh, signed into law by President Biden on November 15th, uh, 2021. So we are you know, three, four months into uh, having an actual transportation bill here. It funds our highway programs uh, for five years, uh, starting with fiscal year 2022 and extending through uh, 2026. It has about $351 billion uh, for highway programs. Uh, unfortunately, not all of that will come to uh, mark for programming. It would, it would certainly be nice if it did, uh, but it does create uh, more than a dozen new highway programs, uh, many of which will have uh, an impact here in Kansas City and will we'll touch the Mid-America Regional Council and, and get us involved in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, they'll, they'll include kind of focusing on resilience, uh, carbon reduction, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and, and bridges is a pretty big one as well. And not all of those will come through the Mid-America Regional Council. Uh, we want, in other words, we will not necessarily have programming responsibility for those. A lot of those will go uh, through the state. Uh, 
the relevant state, but Mark will almost always have uh, some form of role to play in working with the states or local jurisdictions to find uh, the right projects for those programs. Uh, the, I, the IIJA does expand uh, current program eligibilities, uh, which do impact the, pro the programs that we uh, work with here at MARC, and we'll go over those here uh, shortly. And it also, uh, a key component of this is it does reinforce provisions for consideration of multimodal accommodations on uh, projects that are federally funded. So uh, that, is, uh, that is a key component. Uh, you know, you, most of you may know that Mark does have a regional complete streets uh, policy and is, this kind of fits uh, pretty well with those uh, provisions for consideration of multimodal accommodations in the federal bill. Policy focus of the bill is essentially to repair and rebuild roads and bridges uh, with a with an expanded focus on climate change mitigation, resilience, equity, and safety for all users. I think as we move through uh, the presentation and we get to kind of the more regional policy considerations, I think you'll see these kind of themes uh, kind of fit pretty well with what Mark is already doing and what Mark has been working on. So uh, we've been a little bit ahead of the game there, but this it's good to see the federal bill uh, catching up with some of these uh, themes. Uh, it looks to improve transportation options, or reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and also build a national network of EV chargers. So uh, those are kind of the main uh, themes of the, of the new transportation bill. And all of these kinds of things, uh, many of the, the pieces of our scoring and evaluation criteria uh, kind of focus on, on these types of things. Like I said, Mark is kind of uh, a little bit ahead of the game here, although uh, there is always more work to do in making sure that our processes reflect uh, the priorities of the federal bill. Some discussion about the program modifications. Uh, our main funding program, this is the largest one, our surface transportation block grant program. Uh, this is uh, the largest program. It will see an increase in funding, although we're not exactly sure uh, how much we had hoped to know that information by now, uh, but there are a lot of variables in place uh, that, that make it difficult to determine uh, just how much of an increase in funding we will see. Uh, we are still working through, and I think the federal government is still working through uh, the 2020 census numbers uh, that will have impact on those funding decisions. And so it may be a little bit, a little while here uh, before we see those final uh, funding numbers come through. Uh, this is maybe one time where uh, the length of our process may, may benefit us as we will probably see uh, uh, kind of the, the final numbers by the time we get to uh, actually determining programming recommendations. So we'll be able to respond to those increases in funding uh, pretty well. It does maintain the flexibility of the program. That is uh, probably the hallmark of the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program is the flexibility. Uh, you can do quite a few things with it. About the only major thing in our region that folks are not able to do with it is you cannot uh, use it for operating assistance, uh, but you can do pretty much anything else that you want with it. Um, so there is a lot of flexibility to it. And, and probably the, the new bill added some specific eligibilities, including the installation of EV charging and vehicle to grid infrastructure, uh, installation and deployment of intelligent transportation technologies, uh, the use of natural infrastructure or green infrastructure to enhance resilience, uh, facilitation of multi or intermodal connections between emerging transportation technologies and, and others uh, as, as you go along there. The second program that we deal with is what we still refer to as the Transportation Alternatives Program. Uh, this, uh, the more formal name for it is the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program Set Aside. Uh, this, uh, this program is essentially for uh, kind of multimodal transportation, so bicycle and pedestrian. It also has some eligibilities related to uh, historic preservation and a handful of other, other types, but it is uh, essentially alternative transportation. Uh, we'll have a substantial increase in funding, although again, uh, we're not exactly sure how much. The, the overall programming received a significant increase in funding through the, through the new bill. I believe it was 70% or so. Uh, increase in funding for this program. And there was also an increase in the suballocation percentage or uh, the amount of money that comes directly uh, to areas like Mark for programming, uh, that percentage increased as well. So we, we kind of see the best of both worlds there and it maintains all existing program eligibility. So uh, 
Uh, all of those bicycle and pedestrian projects, including safe routes to school, uh, those fall under uh, the transportation alternatives program. Uh, the last main program that we deal with here in this call for projects is our CMAC program or the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program. It too will see an increase in funding simply because of the overall uh, increase in funding through the new transportation bill. Uh, but it does expand some eligibilities to include things like shared micro mobility, the purchase of medium or heavy duty zero emission vehicles and related charging equipment, as well as diesel replacement. And it also, uh, CMAC is one of the few uh, funding streams that you can use for operating assistance. And this bill does maintain the eligibility of operating assistance as an eligible use uh, for federal funds in this case. So uh, glad to see that particular uh, piece uh, maintained in this bill. Uh, that kind of covers our initial kind of stab at uh, some, some of the highlights of changes in the new uh, bipartisan bill. And so uh, I will turn it over at this point to Martin Riverola to walk us through uh, some of those regional policy considerations that you should be uh, thinking about as you uh, put together your application and maybe a little bit about how those uh, regional policy considerations fit within uh, the larger framework of the bipartisan bill. So Martin, uh, take it away. Thank you, Mark. And I've been having some computer gremlins today. Give me the thumbs up. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Awesome. Well, as a, a good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, as, as Mark Hansen just indicated, there, there's a number of regional considerations that we do hope influence uh, the upcoming programming activities um, through our, our, our planning work that many of you are involved in. And uh, this is done with input and involvement from stakeholders from around the region. Uh, we have identified a regional vision, some regional goals, some regional strategies that we hope to implement through our investments that are made. So I'll be touching on some of those key aspects or, or policies or documents or guidance that we have. Next slide. This um, program, uh, this uh, programming process is uh, guided in, in a very large part by Connected KC 2050, uh, which is our long range uh, metropolitan transportation plan for the Kansas City region. Uh, this is a plan that was adopted by our total transportation uh, policy committee, the TTPC, and by our board of directors in June of 2020. So we're going on a year and a half now. Uh, this is a plan which establishes a regional vision for a transportation system and its associated investments. It uh, develops policies and, and strategies for implementing that vision. And it ultimately uh, identifies regionally significant projects that correspond and advance that vision. Next slide. Um, so I'd like to expand a little bit more on the, on the plan uh, adopted goals and, and strategies. Uh, the, uh, the plan identifies these, these goals. These are the things that we want, things on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, and strategies. These are the things that we'll do to, to get there, get to those goals. So what, what do we want? Uh, we want access to opportunity. We want that, that means uh, support it, and we want to support it. We want to support a, a connected system that enables access to sort of all, to all activities. Uh, we want to foster healthy um, communities and individuals by uh, providing safe and secure uh, places to live, walk, bike, ride the bus, uh, and drive with clean air to breathe. Uh, we want a healthy environment. We want to be able to prioritize and support investments that reduce pollution, that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, preserve and restore uh, ecosystem health. Uh, we want to provide a range of uh, transportation choices to allow for ease of travel, uh, as well as public health and uh, environmental benefits as well. And uh, we want to maintain a system that, that supports the efficient movement of goods and, uh, and promotes economic uh, development. I see someone here is on the call waiting to be let in. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, we do have some key strategies that we have identified to help uh, get, get to, to things that we want. Uh, we want to focus on our centers and our corridors to focus our energy and, and our investments around these key activity centers and the corridors that connect them. Uh, we want to we want to build resilience, and we continue to build resilience and reduce climate risks to our transportation infrastructure and our communities, uh, while also ensuring that our that the impact of our transportation system on the climate uh, decreases uh, significantly over time. Uh, we'll, we think we'll be getting to these goals by considering new or additional funding streams when when possible, also by investing in projects that incorporate more than one strategy. 
uh, and bring benefits to the most people. Uh, and maybe last but not least, uh, we want to uh, continue to incorporate data-driven transportation planning into our plans and our various programs. So if you advance the next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to say a few uh, more uh, words about uh, a, a, one of the key policies that was adopted by our TTPC also in, in June of 2020 uh, with the approval of the transportation plan. And, and that was the congestion management process uh, policy. Uh, this is a policy which calls for a systemic way of monitoring, uh, measuring and diagnosing the causes of congestion in, in our system. Um, in, in a few words, uh, this is a policy which indicates that uh, prior to a single occupant vehicle, SOV uh, capacity project, um, a congestion mitigation analysis must be conducted. Uh, if this analysis uh, if, uh, uh, identifies congestion which exists currently in a corridor, uh, travel demand reduction and some operational management strategies really should be explored as part of that project. These are things like transit services, bicycle pedestrian facilities, things like express toll lanes, land use strategies, et cetera. Uh, if this analysis uh, finds that these strategies alone uh, cannot mitigate an ex existing congestion issue, then SOV capacity may be supplemented to this project. Um, really, the sponsor is uh, committed to, must be committed to incorporate these strategies as part of that project uh, as the project is being implemented. And we do have more information on the congestion management process policy in the link that's shared there on the screen. Uh, next slide, please, um, Mark. Uh, the TTPC and the Board of Directors uh, also early in 2021, it's been almost a year now, uh, also adopted a climate action plan. Uh, which really in many ways builds on the on many of the goals and strategies from our Metropolitan Transportation Plan Connected KC 2050. Uh, it sets some broad goals to um, transform uh, uh, sort of our region into a more resilient, equitable, and healthy region. Uh, sets of a goal to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and to adapt to the, the many risks that are, that are um, uh, posed by uh, climate change. Uh, the plan lists a number of strategies to reduce our risk. These are the climate mitigation strategies. The first three here on the list uh, really have to do with uh, our vehicle fleet, uh, decreasing fossil fuel uh, usage, uh, increasing energy efficiency of our system and transitioning our fleet to electric vehicles. Um, the plan also calls for a decrease in our vehicle miles traveled uh, and to increase the multimodal um, usage in, in our system. Uh, mu much of this can be achieved, of course, by improving our stewardship uh, and land use patterns uh, around our key activity centers and corridors, uh, particularly those that may be served by, by transit services. Um, the plan also lists uh, a number of strategies to adapt to impacts of climate change uh, in a region. So it calls for um, conservation and restoration and green infrastructure, uh, healthy living, livable wage jobs, and reduction of waste. Uh, perhaps uh, more relevant uh, to uh, transportation projects that may be submitted through this process, it does call for an increase uh, demand for reused and recycled uh, materials. Uh, next slide, please. The, the plan goes into a little bit more detail about strategies that may be considered in your funding application. So again, it calls for a reduction in vehicle miles traveled, VMT per capita, uh, through land use uh, activities or strategies, through increasing walkability, uh, and implementing complete and green streets elements into your projects. Um, it does call for implementation of strategies that drive us towards uh, a, a cleaner uh, fleet with low and no emission vehicle uh, to be done mostly by expanding our uh, charging infrastructure for electric vehicles and also by electrifying our transit and other public uh, fleets we may have in our region. Uh, the plan calls for a shifting of trips to affordable, equitable and safe mobility options. Once again, by implementing complete street elements uh, and also by uh, building out our smart moves uh, transit vision for our region. Uh, the plan uh, also calls for an increase in our transportation system resilience uh, by redesigning and upgrading our critical uh, and vulnerable infrastructure, and also by making sure to integrate uh, water resources and strategies into our transportation system planning, as an example. Please advance to the next slide. 
a few words to say on our complete uh, streets uh, policy, which actually has been in place and has informed our programming activities over the last uh, few cycles. Uh, we do believe that we're starting to see some positive impacts of this policy being implemented. Um, as a reminder, this is a policy that calls for a system uh, that meets the needs of users of all ages, uh, all abilities and all modes. Uh, there are many benefits to complete streets. Um, these are streets that provide, uh, uh, they improve public safety, they promote um, good health through active transportation. Uh, they provide a large uh, set of economic benefits. Uh, they really do enhance our environmental quality through reduction of, of, of emissions uh, and they ensure long-term savings. Uh, for Mark's definition of a complete streets, uh, complete streets are also green streets. So as such, they support the integration of, of green uh, infrastructure into these uh, streets as well. Next slide. Um, this policy really, as, as Mark um, indicated here at the beginning of his, of his uh, talking points, uh, this is a policy which is consistent with the federal guidance that, that we're seeing. Um, it does indicate that all planned and programmed projects uh, shall provide safe accommodations for all users who have legal access to that roadway. Uh, it applies to all uh, planning activities that involve the public right of way uh, and really any activities that are conducted by MARC to program federal funds. Uh, the policy is sensitive to both uh, current and um, future community context, uh, and there are exceptions that may be granted under certain circumstances. Um, like I said, it has been in place for a few years. Uh, to my knowledge, no exceptions have been requested up to this point, uh, and we are seeing some, some good outcomes from this policy being in place. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark. Um, there are many other policies which also impact this process that uh, we'll be undertaking uh, this year. Uh, we, we have covered now some of the most uh, impactful one at this point, uh, but we'll be providing this information and, and much more in the upcoming weeks as we open up the call for projects. Uh, thank you again for your time, Mark. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, we're we're heading into as I mentioned before that the uh, the new bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, does cover uh, federal fiscal years 2022 through 2026. Uh, many of you familiar with Mark know that we program uh, funding out uh, beyond our normal window of, of kind of certainty about our federal transportation uh, dollars uh, simply to allow those of you developing projects enough time uh, to know how much funding you have and be able to work your way through the various project development processes. So we have already programmed uh, much of the funding out through uh, 2024. So this, the focus of this upcoming funding opportunity will be on federal fiscal years 2025 and 2026. There we go. And we'll be programming these funds using uh, the two-step process that we introduced uh, last time we programmed funds in 2020. And so there is a, a phase one pre-application process, uh, which is essentially an, an assessment by our planning and, pro and policy committees about uh, how well an application aligns with various regional uh, policies and, and, and programs, much of which we, we just discussed uh, and were covered by Martin in his uh, portion of the presentation. And generally that will, uh, they will arrive at kind of an alignment status, whether the project is uh, highly aligned with, with those policy objectives, it, it's aligned with it or it's not aligned with it. And any one of those statuses does not preclude you from moving forward through the application process. Uh, however, those projects that are deemed uh, through the evaluation to be highly aligned or aligned are generally uh, more successful in the process. Uh, we will have then a second phase which some of you who have been through this process before um, the most recent round uh, are more familiar with it. it is just simply the more technical application. Uh, it's much more data intensive in asking uh, questions there. And we'll also do an evaluation there as well and assign a numerical score uh, to the projects as well. Uh, both phases are required. So you do need to be thinking ahead and uh, you do need to make sure that you submit something under phase one uh, to be able to uh, proceed through phase two of the application. I mean, we've also listed out some of those uh, planning and policy committees that will be looking at the first phase of the application there at the bottom of the screen. 
anticipated funding for these three uh, programs. Uh, again, these are very much subject to change. And, and if they don't change, we'll be, we'll be quite honestly stunned. So uh, we're anticipating that all of these are expected to increase, but these kind of give you a baseline of how much funding will be available through all of these uh, different programs in each of the two states involved, ranging from, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program being the largest uh, in Kansas at about $25.6 million, and in Missouri, uh, just under $48 million, uh, all the way down to the Transportation Alternatives Program at $2 million in Kansas and $3.6 million in Missouri over the two-year period that we're, that we're looking at. All told, uh, throughout the region, we're looking to program uh, just under $89 million worth of uh, transportation dollars uh, to projects throughout the region. And so a pretty big uh, impact to be made uh, through these investments in the region. A little bit about our programming timeline here. Uh, we do anticipate opening our phase one pre-application uh, call for projects on March 3rd. Uh, we will be conducting another application workshop similar to this, but uh, much more specific to the phase one pre-application uh, and much more specific to the actual application process, how you step through uh, registering to submit an application, working through the website, what resources will be available to you. Uh, we, will, we will be providing all of that at that uh, March 10th workshop and more information will be uh, coming out of, about that application workshop. On April 1st, the phase one pre-application deadline will close. So just about a month's time there to submit your applications. Uh, keep in mind this phase one pre-application is not uh, terribly long and it is much more narrative based than, uh, than anything else. So it's not, a, it's not a technically difficult application, although you will want to pull in a lot of resources into your answers as the, uh, a lot of policies uh, could potentially apply uh, to your projects and you should make every effort to connect your project to, uh, to as many, many of the policies and, and processes as possible. In early May, our staff assessment of those applications uh, should be complete and we will work with our planning and policy committees uh, on those alignment statuses. And then we will kind of wrap up this phase of the application at the June 21st uh, total Transportation Policy Committee meeting will, where we, we will present those alignment statuses uh, to TTPC uh, for their review. Following that, the phase two application will open on June 23rd. Uh, again, I should caution you, uh, most of these dates are pretty, pretty set, but anything can happen. And so they are, uh, especially in the phase two uh, portion of this, they are subject to change, but we anticipate opening the phase two application on June 23rd. Again, we will conduct an application workshop specific to this phase or phase two of the application on June 30th. And so you'll have about a week to kind of review the application before we do that application workshop. Uh, we will leave that application open till July 29th when, when the deadline comes. We will spend uh, summer and early fall or the remainder of the summer and early fall as staff working through evaluation through the various scoring criteria established by the programming committees. In mid-December and then in the fall, we'll work with those programming committees uh, to develop programming recommendations that should be complete by mid-December and wrapping everything up with mark, mark board approval of the programming recommendations in late January of 2023. And this is a very similar timeline uh, to what we used the last time we did this in 2020. And so we, we feel pretty comfortable with the amounts of, of time that are here. They are uh, pretty much the same periods of time that were available the last time we did uh, an application period. So hopefully things will be consistent and uh, no surprises for you. Uh, as always, Mark will provide uh, a host of resources available to you from uh, geographic information system layers so you can identify where your project is in uh, relation to various things such as activity centers or freight zones, uh, these types of information. Uh, all the policies are available on the MARC website, so you should have easy access to those. Uh, anything you need for completion of an application, uh, we, we generally try to make sure that uh, the application has everything you need. You should not have to uh, venture too far outside of the MARC website in order to find anything you need to complete your application. And with that, uh, we'll put some, we'll 
take some questions, but I'll, I'll throw up uh, contact information uh, for a variety of Mark staff members. You can see uh, Ron Acapul, uh, Martin Riverola, Tom Jacobs, who is our environmental programs director and can be a fantastic resource for you when it comes to uh, the climate, environmental, and green infrastructure questions you might have. And then myself, uh, should you have any questions related to uh, the application process or the funding or just in general how the whole uh, how the whole process works. So I think that kind of brings us to the end. Ron, I don't know if you so I, I, up. I just wanted to offer that if folks we do have some time on the uh, left on the call. So if folks have questions about any of the information we presented now to uh, if you could either enter them in the chat or raise your hand, we'd be happy to uh, to to talk with you and I see Mike Spicklemeyer has his hand raised. So you, you, you want to go ahead? Uh, thanks. I just had a quick question about bridges. Is there, um, I saw you put bridges on the list. Is there a specific set aside and is there a on system, off system bridge component or are we still too early to know that? So when, when it comes to the bridges, Mike, uh, there is no there is no set aside through the programs that Mark does. So in our portions of the surface transportation block grant program, uh, there are there are no set asides, but they are an eligible there are an eligible project. Um, they are one of the, one of the few projects that can be off of the federal aid system and still be eligible. And so the, those are eligible. They uh, sometimes due to their location and kind of low amounts of travel on them. Uh, they do struggle a little bit sometimes with our scoring criteria uh, to kind of be uh, competitive in a lot of ways, but I think our committees are uh, cognizant of the struggles of those particular types of projects and uh, do take some special consideration with that and do uh, kind of discuss those projects at, at length in the programming process. Uh, the new infrastructure bill does, however, have a different program that may be of interest to you, and, and we can share some information about that offline. Uh, but there is a bridge formula program that will be administered through the states, and that may be a good good candidate for some of those offices and bridges as well. All right. Well, thanks for taking my question. All right. Let's see, Steve Schooley has his hand up, and uh, there's also a question in the chat. Steve, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Um, I just can you clarify about which funds could be used for operating expenses? I had understood that CMAC funds could only be used for a short period, it was like two or three years, and that STP funds could be used for operating expenses ongoing, but it kind of sounded like it was the opposite now. Is that the case or what's what's happening with that? No, I, I, I think maybe, maybe, you, maybe you caught me a little bit there. Um, you can't use STP for transit operating. So you can't pay for uh, the operation of a transit route with that. You can under CMAC and it is, a little bit limited in time that you that you can use it for, uh, but you can still use um, STP funds for operation of like a traffic management center okay. to help help with those. That remains eligible. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. My apologies for the confusion on that. So there was a question about match requirements in the chat, and yes, they, they these. These programs all require at least a 20% non-federal match uh, for them. And is land acquisition eligible in, in any of these programs? Um, I, I believe we have funded some right-of-way acquisition in the past associated with, with other construction uh, or implementation work, but it's, it's very unusual for us to fund right-of-way acquisition alone. I think we've done that one time and that I'm aware of, Mark. You may have more information on that. Yeah, the, the two STP committees generally don't. Uh, their, their committee bylaws will, uh, they'll consider it, I suppose, and they, they would evaluate something like that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but generally, the funding that they provide is, uh, their intention is to provide for implementation. And so uh, kind of the engineering and the right-of-way and utility adjustments are generally uh, viewed by those committees as kind of the local jurisdiction or the government agency uh, putting that project in place. It's kind of kind of their responsibility to uh, to fund those particular components of the of the project.
I see there's a, there's a question about 5310 funding. Uh, 5310 is a separate process and that will be coming, I believe we'll be doing a call for projects for 5310 uh, later on in the year, but it is not, it is not part of this uh, particular uh, set of funding streams. Am I correct on the 5310 timeline, Ron? That is that is correct. Uh, it's a separate process, and we'll be launching that call for projects. I uh, believe that will be June first. That's coming up. But again, please watch for that in a separate set of emails and meetings. Okay. And there's a there's a question about getting a copy of the presentation. We will make uh, we will make this presentation available as a as a link on the Mark website, and we'll be sure to uh, to get that out to the list of registered participants. Uh, to to that, so we we will make sure that that link becomes available. It looks like Mike Landvik, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Mike. I do. Thanks. I just have a quick comment. Um, this is a note for Missouri applicants. If you have a project, potential project that's going to be on the MoDOT system at all, then make sure you reach out to your area engineer sooner than later. Part of the process, you'll need a, a letter of support from them. Uh, and so, just to reiterate for. Uh, Jackson County, uh, we have a new area engineer, uh, Jackson and Cass County, excuse me, uh, Erica Ross, she took over from Matt Killian, that's uh, Jackson and Cass, and then Mark Fisher for uh, Platt and Clay. So again, if you have a project that's on the mobile system that you're planning on applying for, make sure you reach out to them sooner or later to get that letter and just to uh, just explain the particulars of the project, make sure they're just on the same page with you on that. So thanks. Thanks, Mike. That's a good point. And the same same also applies for uh, projects on the Kansas side. If you're proposing anything that impacts KDOT system, it's a great idea to be in touch with the KDOT staff ahead of time. Thank you, Ron, for mentioning that for KDOT. And there's another question in the chat box about letters of support uh, and local match commitments required for the phase one uh, pre-application or are they required for phase two? Uh, you can, there will be an opportunity under the phase two application to submit uh, kind of those letters of support and, and resolutions and local match commitment. I, uh, there is an opportunity to do that. Martin, is there, is there a component to that on the phase one application? I do not recall. No, I don't, no, there's not. It's, a, it's under the phase two. Great. Right. And I don't, I don't see any additional questions and I don't see anyone with their hand up. So once again, just to reiterate the offer for folks that have specific questions about specific projects that you may not want to ask in a large group like this, uh, staff here is happy to happy to talk with you about any of the anything you may be considering applying and uh, or applying for and um, and may be able to give some some good advice about that as well. So please feel free to reach out to the contacts that Mark has uh, listed there. Uh, one more question about indirect costs being permissible. Um, this is Allison Smith with KDOT and I can say at, for KDOT indirect costs are not um, allowed. Thanks Allison. Yeah, I would reiterate that. Concur. All right, Ron, I'm not seeing any additional. I'm, I'm not either. I'm trying to be patient and let folks, <laughs> if they are typing, uh, it, one more shot at it. But it uh, looks like that the, the chat has sort of slowed down, and I don't see anyone with their hand raised. So. Um, if, if no one else has other questions at this point, um, like I said, feel free to reach out to us afterwards and, uh, and, and please uh, stay with us in the process. We will be doing another one of these workshops that's more focused on uh, specific applications uh, next month in March. So. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.